introduction of yourself um, and uh, what your accelerator program uh, is about, and maybe what's the the, the strengths of your um, accelerator. So, Tanya, would you maybe start? Yes, hi, and a big welcome from my side as well. My name is Tanya Kuchner, and I'm the managing director for Startup Bootcamp here in Berlin. Uh, my background is mostly investing, more, more on the VC side, but also in corporate venturing. Um, I used to run Lyra in Munich before I came to Berlin. Uh, and my program here um, focuses around a specific vertical industry, which happens to be smart transportation and energy. Um, we're about to announce a second vertical, which will be digital health here in Berlin. Yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for the invitation, first of all. My name is Rune Thiel, I'm one of the co-founders of Rockstars. Uh, we have three programs, two specific verticals, health and energy, and then we have a horizontal program that we call Web Mobile. Hi, I'm Jens from Texas in Berlin. Um, my background is I, uh, I've just started companies, so I have been in startups all my life, and I went over to the investing side a few years ago, and, um, and then I joined Techstars, where I'm making about 10 investments a year and help make another 20 or so. Um, Techstars has got, I don't know how many programs we have right now, so between 20 and 25 that we run per year out of 16, 17 cities. Um, so we invest in about 250 companies per year, I think. Um, and, you know, that is the strength of Techstars, is we have an enormous global network of hundreds, I mean, over 700 online companies now, and hundreds and hundreds of investors who invest in those companies. Hi, my name is Karen Goodman. Uh, I'm the Managing Director of uh, Wire in Munich. Uh, we're one of 11 academies, uh, four in Europe, uh, the rest in Latin America. And we belong to Telefonica, which is our main strength. So if you're a startup and you're trying to do something in the mobile space, uh, you should be with us. Perfect. So, um, as I understood, um, Rockstar and um, uh, Startup Bootcamp um, but also uh, tech stars um, with uh, the, the Barclays Accelerator, and now I learned also uh, Vira uh, are, are specializing in verticals and somehow. So would you um, um, advise startups to really look out for this um, uh, um, verticalized um, accelerators and pick the right uh, accelerator for the right niche? Or um, do you think uh, it's, it's more about the, the brand, more about the accelerator itself? Um, what do you think? Uh, I mean, I'm going to say, yeah. obviously I'm going to say you should be choosing a, a vertical. If you're a startup, you should be focusing. Uh, you're, you're always going to need money, so you should be doing everything you can to attract investment. And uh, you should choose uh, very carefully who you join. If, you haven't, if there isn't a very strong focus in your vertical, then you'll fail. So, um, you know, as much as I love my colleagues, I happen to believe accelerators work best in uh, big corporates. Well, I have a, obviously a very strong opinion because we've done this pivot about you know a year and a half or two years ago. We decided you know we started a camp brand global. Yes, it's cool, it's awesome, but it, we need to verticalize. Um, it makes so much more sense. So if you look at our London program, for example, in London and New York and Singapore, we do exclusively fintech. And we're just launching a new program just for accelerators. So what happens in those programs, we've got just about every big bank or in the insurance program, every big you know, um, insurance company. If you get to sit with the head of innovation and you're an insurance vertical and you get to sit with those departments every day, I mean, come on, that's not rocket science, right? That's going to help you tremendously. Here in Berlin, Smart Transportation and Energy, I've got seven mobility partners and one big energy company. The teams get selected because in that selection funnel, Deutsche Bahn or EMBW or you know Daimler, Mercedes-Benz says, I want that startup because I want to do this in this kind of trial. So you know, I don't think you could do that um, if, if, we, if we were just broad. So I think that works for me great. I agree with most of those points. Uh, I think an important aspect to look at when you're a startup is really what kind of vertical are you in and do you need a vertical accelerator? So our approach has been to focus on areas where you really need to work with larger players, you need certificates to come into the market, and you need a lot more testing. Uh, for example, in the health space, we connect it to universities, to the hospital. Um, and I think this is where you see a lot of the value for being in a vertical. 
then I see a lot, and maybe it sounds like uh, a lot of verticals coming up, I'm not entirely sure what that vertical is about. I'm not entirely sure of the focus of the vertical. Um, and then I think as a startup, you have to look at why that vertical exists in the first place. So if, let's say, um, that's a very specific vertical that only have one founding partner behind it, which could be a big corporate, I think you should know, you should realize right away why that corporate is investing in an accelerator. And that is the vibe very clear. It's not so clear for every other accelerator. I think that that's something to think about as a startup before you make a decision. Realize who's actually investing into your company. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we run both. We have the, you know, the, the traditional city programs, we call them, and the, um, the vertical programs that we run in collaboration with corporate partners. And you know, companies go into the vertical accelerator with corporates because they want to do a business development deal with a corporation. You know? uh, and that makes quite a lot of sense. What that also means is that typically these companies are much later stage. Because if you're very, very early and your product has just been launched like a few weeks ago, it's almost just, you know, it's very difficult to do a deal with Barclays or Disney or somebody like that. Yeah. So the, the, the products tend to be much more mature, much more defined, you know, proven in the, in the vertical uh, programs. And we focus very heavily on business development deals in, in those programs. The city programs are much more flexible, they're much more early stage, um, you know, much more experimental. And we like that kind of blend. Okay. So, um, overall, the accelerator space is, uh, really uh, seems like to be booming, like uh, every week there's a new accelerator popping up uh, somewhere in Europe, and um, do you uh, have the feeling that it's maybe too much for the market, or maybe do you already start to, um, to see some effects um, of these um, um, many uh, startup accelerators in the market, like um, do you have lower applications, or is it, it's, it's Stagnating, or um, how do you see this um, uh, this this um, mass uh, this mass of uh, startup accelerators out there? Yeah, I mean we 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 run whatever. I mean we think this. There, I mean, I'm going to ask you questions in sequence, right? So we get more applications pretty much with every program. So we don't see that effect of decreasing applications. Um, certainly not in my experience. We uh, we think there are going to be far more corporate programs in particular going forward. Um, and we'll also think there will be far less corporate programs going forward. You know, because um, it's actually not so trivial to run such a program successfully. So you, you know, if you do it well, then you'll continue, you'll expand into possibly multiple locations like what, what, what Barclays did with, or, you know, with, with one of our programs. Um, and then other corporates already have already shut down their accelerators. I think you're going to see both. I'm not so sure I like the word anymore. Accelerators. When I saw the invitation to this panel, I was like, "Well, an accelerator nowadays. Uh, it seems like every neighbor in his dog has one, right? Like I, I met one in the airport that had an accelerator. But at least, at least you're a leading accelerator. Yeah, well, you're leading. And then, then we have to find what leading means, right? Like, um, we try to move away from accelerators. So focusing on supporting startups within the first 1,000 days. That's our short pitch." That's what we're trying to do. We try to have formats that support them initially when you just come up with your idea and you need feedback, validation, network. When you go into acceleration, it's a different state, so we have another format for that. And we have a format when you're done with acceleration. And that's kind of what we look at. We look at the whole journey for, journey for a startup and we think acceleration is just a small part of it. Um, so we actually, the word accelerator, I don't think anyone even ever defined it, what it means and what it's supposed to have. But um, I see very few real accelerators that I would define to be an accelerator, the way it, it means to us at least. But you and I are the same, right? Actually, all of us. I think we're we, we, yeah. we all the same. For the most part. Um, well, let's put it this way. So we have to go out and work with big corporates on the one hand because I think that gives us the focus for the startups that come in here. At the same time, what we do is acceleration. That three months is a very short time, right? That's the whole thing. They get a little bit of pizza money, they've spent three months, they meet a ton of people, way more than they want to. You know, after week four they're like, don't put any more mentors in front of me, I can't take it, I gotta work on my product. Um, 
And then the added sort of the zucker on top, as we say in German, is that they do have, you know, Daimler or Airbus or, or Cisco coming in on a regular basis. I used to have a saying where I say the first kiss of the death, death for a startup is dealing with a big corporate. Right? Um, I, I'm learning that there's actually beauty in that. There's a little bit of both. So I, the teams have to do the acceleration with us, you know, independent of the corporates. They need to go out there and find other partners to play with and to, to business with um, outside of the corporates that are just taking forever. Right? And this is a hard part. How do you combine a three-month program where massive stuff is supposed to happen and traction um, when it takes a corporate three months just to give you the first meeting, right? So it's, it's, my job is also helping these corporates become more innovative and faster. And most of them have come to us because they said, you know what, we used to do it ourselves. We, used to, we thought about running our own accelerator. We're, we're crap at it. We suck. Um, we're going to give that to those people that are, are, are better at it. And we'll just participate on the innovation side. So that's, that was our learning. Uh, thanks, Tanya. Uh, so, we, uh, so I work for a big corporate. I work for Telefonica. Um, I report to the CEO. Um, we run the biggest mobile network here in Germany, 48 million consumers. And startups are able to make use of that. So um, if they want to uh, ramp their business up over a nine month period, is what we do, um, what, what would normally take maybe two and a half years, um, we accelerate. And that's what an accelerator is. So it, moves you from one space to another much faster than normal. It accelerates, it's as simple as that. Um, we do that as a big corporate because we need the innovation, we need the new products, the new ideas, and it's been very, very fruitful for us. We've, of all the wireless startups, and there are 650 globally, we've um, bought from 50% of them, which is a proof that we're using that innovation. Uh, we could have done more, of course, working blending uh, big stuff, uh, big, big corporations with uh, startups is really tricky. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the jobs that I have. I started in big corporate in uh, Atos, the IT consulting company, 20 years ago. Um, I did six years there and then I went to startups and I went back to Telefonica a year and a half ago. So I know, I know both worlds, I know both sides of the coin and uh, as, a, as an ex-CEO of a startup, or startups rather, I, I also know the benefit of being inside big corporate, but it's tricky, you know, and we, we, we choose people who can work with Telefonica, so that's one of the criteria going into work. So we talked about before, there are more and more accelerators in the world, for sure, but um, I think in this country at least, or in this part of Europe, um, what they're helping to do is filter out all the crappy startups and people who have dreams which will never come to be. To the, to the really great ideas with the really strong founders who can work with corporations. Like it or not, the world is corporate now. So the whole world is now run by corporates. And if you're a startup inside an accelerator or not, you will do business with a big corporate. Whether that's Google, the corporates you like, or the corporates like Exxon who you don't like. So, uh, you know, join a corporate accelerator and enjoy the benefits. You know? Speaking of benefits, uh, so my personal fear of uh, joining an, ex an accelerator would be uh, that it's very time consuming, consuming and um, that there is maybe um, um, a chance that I um, miss to do actual work or work on the uh, uh, with, with customers and stuff. Um, so, um, how much uh, time does does your program um, uh, take per uh, per day or per, per week? And um, yeah, how much time of, of mentoring or um, or or other parts of the program is it? Um, can you explain this? Quickly thing? answer that for us. It's six. We the acceleration program lasts for six months. And it's about a day and a half a week, and then there's loads of different events which are optional. For us, in the three months, it's really hard. I I have a template that I can follow where I can offer workshops three days a week or four days a week, right? And I can keep these entrepreneurs massively busy. I don't do that because I think the most important thing is in the first two weeks they meet as many mentors as they possibly can. The corporates know the technology; they open doors, and from there on out, it's tailor made. So I mean, I sit with my teams at least two hours every week and one on ones, and then I talk to them all day every day. And I know what they need, right? And then they tell me, shit, I really need UX UI workshop. Then it's my job to go out there and find that and make that happen. But I don't run a program, a mini MBA for, you know, most of my founders are serial entrepreneurs. This is their second or third startup. 
So it's tailor-made, and it's where my job is out there, and I just hustle for them. If they need to meet a certain someone, and they need somebody in, to help them on B2B sales, my job is to go out there, find that person, connect them, and then that's my job. Done, right? Because I do have three months, it goes by fast. Um, most products don't finish as quickly as you think. <laughs> And yeah, customer discovery is a bitch, so that's the only time I, I don't want to see them is when I kick them out. It's like, talk to customers, show me that you have, give me proof, sometimes I'll go in on those calls, and then that's what, that's what they need to spend their time on, especially in the beginning. I guess there must be some bad experience out there, because this is not the first time I've heard that kind of question, uh, doing the last uh, selection for our latest Bastion, Bastion and Digital Health. We had three startups that felt it was too far, they didn't have time to work in their business. I mean, that's the point, being an accelerator, we want to help you working on your business, right? We invest in your company, we are an active investor from day one. You are jumpstart into a network, that should be what you get. Um, then there's different ways, of course, to think about how much information you should be throwing at people. And uh, the way that we look at it is uh, opt-in from the founders. So basically, we show them everything we plan for them. They say, if they, in, in the beginning of each phase, find something they don't like, uh, we change it. Because we're not here to present information or, or any kind of MBA material they're not interested in. So they set up the program, it's their program. It's very clear from the beginning. And then, uh, on a practical level, it's just doing it outside business hours. So we do it uh, either late in the evening, uh, or we do it over the weekend. And that's why we say it's a double full-time job, it's not something you can do on the side. We run the program outside business hours, but obviously, you're supposed to work on your business as much as possible, and uh, to, to allow you to do that, we just uh, keep the days open, basically. But I think any program should be focused around what the founders need. Yeah, I, the way I think about it is that Entrepreneurs are exceptionally good at wasting time. <laughs> That's how we all but First time entrepreneurs are amazingly good at it. And, um, you know, just by telling them you don't have to do that, I give you permission to not do these things. I free up so much time, I create extra time. Yeah. So, I think the companies in the three months they're with us, they probably get done what they typically would have gotten done in nine months. So it's not that they're wasting time, they're actually gaining time. That's why it's called an accelerator. But that's what it's all about. And what we do or what we don't do. I mean, from an entrepreneur's perspective, it's all irrelevant. The only thing that matters is the end result. It's where you work for, where you are afterwards. You know, how much value has your business gained? How much have you grown? Is that worth the equity that you're giving up or not? That's basically the, that's the kind of way in which you should think about it. Don't worry so much about how many hours a week we're doing things with you or anything like that. That's really not the point. Okay. So, um, and could you all walk us through the process on, of uh, how you actually pick um, the startups that are going to participate in your accelerator programs? Like, are you looking more? Um, is it a good team, or is the idea good, or was the pitch awesome? So, what is most important for you? And um, yeah, maybe give a, give us some insights what what, what tend to work over the, the years um, if, if the idea um, or um, team is, is actually uh, more important. So, you know, I, I have the great privilege of of helping build the future by investing in companies. I mean, that's really my, that's what I do for a living. It's awesome, isn't it? So, if I think that somebody can't build a future, I want to invest. I mean, the tech stars we say it's team, 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 market idea, and traction. And that's generally true for every investor, right? So, obviously, if the people are uninvestable, or don't or have no idea what they're doing, why would you invest? If the market is terrible, why would you invest? If they haven't had an insight, they haven't cracked anything, why would you invest? If they haven't got even minimal proof point of anything that they're supposed to have achieved, why would you invest? Right? All investors want all of those things. Um, and then it's just personal nuances as to what you like. Um, and the kind of person that you are. So for example, if I, you know, me, if I invested in a fashion startup, that would be terrible, right? So I'm not going to get into this like that. I'm going to let other people take care of those kind of companies. And I'm going to more invest in some things that, you know, I have a personal preference for, like, I don't know, hard content, building skills, and something or something like that. You know, that's sort of my personal thing. 
yeah, I guess we're all in the early stage investment game, right? So it, at that level, it's about the people. I mean, there's nothing really else that you can determine. Uh, so if we break it up, we always say it's like 60% on the team, 30% uh, on the market, because you can have an amazing team in the wrong market that doesn't move at all. It doesn't matter how good the team is, they're not gonna make it. Uh, and then 10% on the starting point. And that's basically looking at what they have already, uh, because of course it's your baby, right? And if you're very stuck in a specific direction, you already made certain moves, and we think it's an interesting market, but approaching it completely wrong, uh, an accelerator program might not be the place where you want to flip that whole thing, and uh, flip the mentality of the founders and the idea that they already have. Uh, so very simple, I think it's the same. It's about team, it's about the people, and it's about the marketing. So much more I can add to that is it's always the people. I mean, for the most part, you know, I think it, most of them have an MVP. By the time I see them, I travel to 20 cities, met with uh, 10 teams in every city. Um, that way I know them. I've had a good chance of meeting at least a third of the applications that we see online. The rest of the time, I just have Skype calls. I, that's not a pitch. You know, you just you interview the teams. I know in the back of my head what MBW likes in the energy space and what they don't. So if I'm, I've got renewable energy startups, I know I don't have to bother bringing into them into the funnel of selecting because MBW is not interested in that. They're looking for a smart meter, smart home. So it kind of helps me. I work, it's a little bit of both. Of course, I select the teams in the end, but I'm also scouting on behalf of these big partners, knowing what's in their sweet spot. And you know, if I see you know 79 parking apps, I'm not going to invest in another parking app because there's, you know, 79 in Europe alone. So that kind of thing, and successful ones out there already. So, um, yeah, but it's it's the people. Yeah, I invested in a successful parking app. Thanks. Um, so I brought um, one of our teams along today. Andre, stand up a minute. Stop tweeting. He's uh, doing facial recognition software, okay, based on a pattern coming out of Harvard University. And that's something that Telefonica is very interested in for lots of different reasons, for our customers, for our own business, um, et cetera. And that's basically how we structure the business. So we, I, I work very closely with the managing directors of all the lines of business. They tell me all their different pains, all the things they're trying to fix. Uh, we filter in all the stuff coming out of Madrid, where, where Global Digital is based. And we come up with a picture of the kind of teams we want in, in Wyoming, the kind of teams we want to invest in. And then, of course, the things that the Jens talked about earlier, they're all givens. And uh, yeah, and, and, and the people that I invest in personally um, on behalf of the company, they need to be able to work with me and I need to be able to work with them. Because like, as Tanya said, um, it's, a very, it's actually a very personal business being, being running an accelerator. Um, you're there in the office, um, you're not working with uh, colleagues at your company, of, you're not, they're, they're not, you're not on a, but you're on a fairly equal level. And, you do need to respond when they say, hey, Garen, I need to talk to you about this, you know? I mean, days out of the office are, are a holiday, to be yeah, honest. It's like raising <laughs> kids, right? In a way. I wouldn't say that. Old I mean, he's, he's old enough to not be my child. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a little bit like that. I mean, I'm a parent, you're a parent, right? Yeah. So it helps a lot, yeah. But it's, but it's more like um, the, the companies themselves, the startups, are more like the children rather than the people. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great joy when you see Teams like Park Pocket or Neokami or Fudora, who everyone should know about by now, um, do what they've done in the last year. It's, it's, it's joyful. It is an amazing job, frankly. Um, it's exhausting, but it is an amazing job. So, uh, Agreed. That's one out there. <laughs> Perfect. So I would have one or two additional questions, but um, I would suggest that we now switch over to a, a short Q&A. So we would have like uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, if some of you uh, has a question uh, for these panelists. Is there someone? Not perfect for you. Not difficult. And what's the price, what's the money? Okay, we have a gross margin of 35% in each order because we have really big deals and partners in Europe. And that's the thing. Uh, let's stop here. Uh, we just start four founders. Uh, Two months ago, three months ago, more or less. Now we have people from the United Kingdom, people from Croatia, and our advisors, uh, Evaristo Abe. Maybe you will don't know him, but he's the founder of Sindel Andal, 
the same as the liver hero here, uh, and he's the father of Cinder and Spain and Mexico, both with exits. Our expansion. We are now in Valencia, Madrid, and in February we will open in Mexico, and in March in Milan and Houston. Why? Because we have uh, good partners, and we can scale and open more or less in which, uh, all the cities in the world. But right now we are just focusing in Spain, and in February we will open in Mexico. All of our competitors are in a war in London and Berlin, and we don't want to be in problems with that, so just go to Mexico. So please take out your laundromat, because you can try it. You can try to wash. Look, look at me. It's not a problem of my language. So I try to, to iron it, but it's almost impossible. So if you want to be okay, if you want to be perfect in your office, and if you want to enjoy your time, be with people you really love, stop to do it. Love it, okay? So use Mr. Here, enjoy your time. Thank you. Perfect. Sure. I'm David. I am I'm from Berlin. I'm a venture capital and just, just finished building up a new fund uh, which is yet to be named uh, with one partner and one associate. Uh, we invest in everything that's what we call fundamental tech, i.e. Um, slightly more transformative and non-incremental, if you will, and how everyone interprets this. So uh, that's what we do. We, we, we're closely aligned with, uh, with um, um, high-ranking executives from Google and also with uh, a hedge fund manager from originally Germany, so we cover the entire spectrum of uh, technology. Hi, I'm Venetia. I work for a um, firm called Redstone Digital. We're based here in Berlin, a team of nine, and we are a little bit different from our peers in the, in the ecosystem in the sense that we manage six different funds, three early stage, one growth, to buy out, we can invest anything from 25,000 all the way through to 200 million, um, especially in the enterprise space. Uh, hi, I'm Nick from Passion Capital. We're an early stage fund based out of London. We uh, do seed investing around ticket size, somewhere around uh, 300,000, 400,000 euros is our average check size. Usually take about 15 to 20% for that. So we like to see companies when they're very early, often pre-revenue, um, often pre-product. Um, so we're really stage focused rather than sector focused. But we do, um, one of our criteria is that we do look for very technically uh, skilled founders. So that's one of our, our big things is we're at least a co-founder or a co-founding team that are very technical. Perfect, thank you very much. So the next startup is actually from Germany. Um, it's uh, 3D QR, so please come to the stage, um, 3D QR. I'm actually done. Thanks. Sure. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm Daniel from 3D QR, and uh, I would like to talk about augmented reality. Um, yeah, I think you probably know augmented reality before, but for those of you who don't know it, it's like this new cool technology uh, which can bring the digital content right into reality. I just made up an imaginary picture of what could have been, for example, for a flyer or poster of this conference, um, where you can just put videos, 3D models, interactive buttons and whatever you want directly to the spot where, where you need it. And companies are trying this out at the moment and it's, uh, they're very, very, uh, and they like it very much. But the problem at the moment uh, is there's no standard. Um, there's it's all individual solutions. There's a lot of manual work to produce this augmented reality uh, experiences. And uh, even though there are some, some uh, attempts to optimize it, um, they're still missing this, this uh, thing which can standardize it. And we uh, thought about it for a long time, and then we came up with a solution. We just took a standard which already exists, which is a QR code. And we uh, build an algorithm to combine every normal QR code which is there into a full augmented reality scene. So now, um, then we build a platform together with it where you can um, just companies or normal users can go to this platform and click together their augmented reality content. Um, they will get a QR code out of it or you can use a QR code they already have and then use our app to uh, see just every, every normal QR code as a full augmented reality scene with all their interactive content directly inside the reality. 
Um, so yeah, that's how we are going to put this minority report experience, um, this uh, futuristic augmented reality, and make it possible to uh, bring it really to the mass market. Yeah, um, where are we now? Um, we already, um, like, like I said, we uh, did a lot of research and developed our technology. We uh, applied for a patent now uh, to secure it for ourselves. Um, we have built a prototype, which you just saw in the pictures, which is already functioning and working. And we're just about to go to the market. Um, we have several strategic partners, like bigger companies, which we already talked to, which want to try it out in the first place to make it popular. Um, and the next steps would be, uh, we want to, first we want to make the product really uh, market ready. We want to grow our team a bit more. Um, and then just make the, the market start with a big bang and make it really, make it really count. Um, yeah, this, I wrote the sum, which would be like our ideal goal of investment. But of course, um, there would also be, we're looking for more partners or uh, more help, all that we can get in this team. Yeah, thank you very much. Now it's Attila from Hot Time. The stage is yours. Hello. The startup that I want to present to today operates in a huge market, a market worth hundreds of billions. And this market is not dominated by any big one big player. Plus, the startup that I want to present to you is not a copycat, which is in Europe a topic. So that means that it has the potential to be a worldwide leader. <coughs> so the market too limiting. The market that I'm talking about is the leisure market. It's all about what you do in your free time. Your free, the free time, as, at least in Western countries or industrialized countries, what we do in our free time is quite important for us. We want to make the most out of it. We want to spend more time with our friends, we want to discover random locations, and we want to make, also make maybe new friends. However, today what we see is that organizing and finding social activities is rather time consuming because the apps and tools that we currently have are many, there are many of them, but they are impersonal and they are incompatible. So we think that we need one app, a personalized app to plan all your social activities and hobbies. Um, looking back again to the market size, the global leisure market is worth like two, two and a half trillion dollars. And the non-travel part, so the domestic, is also huge. However, and maybe one more metric, the side product of Facebook, you know, this little Facebook event is used by 450 million people. So it's a huge market, which is really there for a company to take. And we think that if you control leisure planning, you also control the whole leisure market. Good, I mean, the question that always comes, this is a huge market, why is it not real life? Surely there is one company that already does this. Well, there are many, there are actually thousands of leader apps. However, the problem is that they all focus on bits and pieces, or do it as a side product. Like Facebook events is quite big, but it was, Facebook was never meant to do personalized leisure planning, so it, you need a lot of Many features are missing. Daniel, maybe some of you heard of Meetup. Meetup is only you know, about groups or finding new people. And then you have event lists and, and, and. All of them actually either are byproducts, side products, or are niche players. So there is no personal, seamless life uh, leader planning experience. So what we have is that what to fill this gap, Optime is the all-in-one leisure app. An app which you can plan all your hobbies and all leisure activities. <coughs> so when we go a bit into detail, what we have is that you can discover event and locations. So what can I do in the city without even spending a lot of time? What are the cool things that I can do in my city? The second part is that I want to meet my friends more often. I want to schedule events with them. 
or I want to meet new people. It's been a, we are also actually one of the few apps ever to be able to mix these two things. And the main part, a personal leisure calendar so that you can plan everything, all your leisure activities. Some of you might still ask the question sometimes down, how does we make money? When I say that we control the whole leisure market, but still the question comes. One of our things is that um, sponsor slot is one of our packaging. It's a bit like Google AdWords. Every activity at home can be categorized, and per category you can then you will be able to pay to be added up, get events, locations, and hobby courses. Plus, we are thinking about a freemium that you know if you use the Hoptown platform commercially, even then you will have quite a lot of things covered, but then like, if you pass a certain threshold, it will be higher. And the last thing, this is just exploratory, but when I was working for a large corporate, this was also a topic, is to have our software as white label for large corporations so that their internal events for their, you know, for their people coming together. Um, all right, actually, the last two things is the team and where we stand. I think the questions will come to that, so I'll leave that to the questions. <laughs> Can you talk about the team? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So basically, <laughs> but in three minutes more was not possible. So, um, so basically, my background, we are two, me and um, a CTO. My background is actually in telecommunications. Um, and I uh, used to be the head of online analysis of uh, actually the biggest uh, private telecom company of Switzerland. And before I worked for HP. And my uh, CTO, he has been, has also in a high traffic website experience as a lead developer of a travel website in Turkey. And yeah, we are marketing. Basically, we are uh, in Zurich, it started, where I come from. And then Berlin, now we are based. And Istanbul, where also a lot of the well, team members are located. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll try to explain the biggest value first, and then I go through the slides faster. So, could you imagine a world that you can pay without any kind of belongings? So, uh, to get the picture, imagine if you go to a store naked, without smartphone, without car, and you still can pay. You pay just with yourself. And this is safe. <laughs> okay, these are the, the current solutions that are in the market now that you maybe already know with QR code, some others like iZetto or Petalum, they offer you an extra device and as everybody knows, Apple Pay, they need the, the iPhone to, to read your, your fingerprint. So can we do this better? Yeah, this is what we do. We make payments, this is the flow, in-store, this is the merchant uh, layout, so it's easy to, to imagine the flow, it's exactly how it is now. The merchant side just input the value, hand, hand it to the consumer, he inputs a pin and then take a selfie and the payment's done. Okay, this is the, the customer uh, slide that you can see, uh, how we can use the pictures only for the customers to assess as a signature for chargeback and contesting, or this kind of stuff. Here is uh, just talking a, a little bit about the, the benefits we offer for the merchants. No extra device, and also reduced fees. This all the, the total cash brings a really uh, discount for them. Also, we're offering now a fidelity tool inside our app. And for the consumer, like I said, it's no belongings. It's really flexible, uh, it's convenient, and uh, the variability we can check with the, the picture later. Okay, this is the target, what we are looking for. That are, uh, the, the model that we want to replicate, it's more or less like Square Deal with Starbucks, because fran the franchises, it's easier to scale when you close a, a deal with the master franchise. And also, we already have a first client deal uh, agreement, in Spain, North Spain, which uh, is uh, the biggest entertainment group uh, from Catalonia. 
but also uh, we see uh, uh, SMBs, autonomous self-employers, peer-to-peer, and then later on to, to implement our solution. This is just a big picture about the mobile payment market that you already know that it's getting increasing crazily. Already these numbers are wrong because in 2015 we already almost <coughs> in one trillion dollars volume per year. Here, uh, it's a little bit about, uh, I can tell about our revenue model because we have this proprietary uh, product that is for payments, but we also later on want to offer this as an API for security transactions or for apps like Uber, that, like they did with Braintree to integrate, to embed our solution inside their app. Uh, just to talk, the most important thing, the biggest asset of the company is the proprietary face recognition engine created by Giovanni, the CTO, who was uh, researched for eight years. He did a PhD in Harvard and he used the deep learning. We have the, the patent for this. Also, he won as the best face recognition engine in 2013. This is a little bit about the, the ecosystem of payments. Uh, as you can see, we consider it as a super choir now because we, we have back processors as very phone and stripe. But later uh, we want to, to be established as a acquirer. We are already taking care of this in UK. So we, we can cut this uh, extra cost we have. But uh, just a little bit about the partners. We are already talking, we are already doing because uh, we did the biggest and most important because we are a chicken and egg, a B2B2C company. So Telefonica was so important because of that, because they have consumers, they have 3 million in the world, Brazil, I'm from Brazil, we want to go back to our country with this. And Telefonica is the biggest telco there, in Germany, also uh, in Spain. So those are the little competitors that we can say, there is nothing like us in the market, but we can compare with Rise Apple Pay 11 or Apple Pay because they do also install payments with mobile uh, POSs. Uh, just a little bit about me and Giovanni. My background is in investment banking in Brazil. Uh, maybe you know UBS, Pactual, who was a uh, Brazilian investment bank bought. I worked there for three years. And Giovanni, he was a researcher, a university researcher, with PhD uh, half in Unicum and half in Harvard. And we are really Happy to say that we have now Telefonica and O2 here in Germany and why they are accelerating us. And it's amazing the last month uh, how much progress we had there. Uh, I cannot say here in 15 minutes, but it's really changing our life. That's it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex. And at Shipwise, we are fundamentally changing how companies engage in international trade. What very few people know and actually think about is that 90% of stuff in this room in your everyday life at home was at some point in a standard steel shipping container like this. However, even today, nearly all of those shipments are arranged the old-fashioned way over email, telephone, and fax. I present to you the workhorse of the shipping industry in 2015. So. This, of course, causes massive inefficiencies. It can take a company at least a week or more sometimes to find out how much it will cost them to bring the stuff from point A to B. And then another five phone calls to actually get a confirmed quote for that. So shipping a container today. Oh, right now. <laughs> shipping a container. Can be a bloody nightmare. The process is confusing, and transparent, and complex. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite ridiculous, I mean, you're understanding the same thing here. Companies have no idea where their stuff is, no visibility, and they have no idea if they're actually getting a good deal or not. Whereas, larger companies have, in a way, shielded themselves from this with large logistic departments and EDI integrations into their you know, logistics providers. For at least 23 million small and medium enterprises in Europe, this is a huge problem. 15 to 50 percent of an SME budget for logistics goes towards bullshit. We believe there's a better way. We're building a software and a human intelligence layer to solve this. 
to eliminate the numerous emails and phone calls from the quarter overall, to allow companies to book and manage their shipments in the cloud, to share and track, track and trace data with their team, with their co-workers and with their partners, and of course provide clear and transparent transactions. This allows us to reduce costs for the companies and increase the leverage because there are massive inefficiencies in the system. Of course, we simplify and speed up the paperwork and reporting, which mountains of paperwork will blow your mind. We're talking about you know 30 documents to import something into Europe. And for the first time, many of the companies that work with us finally can glean insights into the supply chain, something they've never been able to do before. So in, this, in essence, we're making shipping you know, simpler, quicker, and more informed for these companies. <coughs> we're not doing it alone. We're actually partnering with a lot of companies around the world to build a global provider network to help us do this. And we're able to do this because we know shipping. We spent more than two decades in this industry. We know exactly just how screwed up it is, but we also know how to fix it. Because, once again, logistics is 12% of global GDP, and we honestly think it's a little too much to spend to move your stuff from me to me. And we want to reduce that. Happy shipping. Alright, so good afternoon. I am John Doe. My background is engineering and innovation for NASA, Airbus, and European agencies. And with this project, I aim to tackle a major society issue by taking a system view of how society works. So today, it is mostly companies and governments that decide what is good for you guys. So companies decide which product you should buy, and government decide what legislation you have to follow. But from an engineer's point of view, this is a very inefficient system that generates a lot of waste because the outputs generated by these guys on the top very rarely match the inputs expected by the people. I mean, how many times have you stumbled upon a product and said, this is exactly what I need? Except for looking at the dishes of the other guys before me, because it's amazing, I thought. But, so what are the inputs that the people need? These are dreams, expectations, goals, concerns. So if you manage to flip the scheme upside down with the people driving from their needs what is being implemented by the guys who actually have the executive power, you'll get a much more efficient society. And this line here, I'm sure it will accelerate faster. So how do we do it? So we let the people tell their dreams, their issues, and we group them per idea. So when you get a growing number of people that actually want something to happen, what is it? It's an emerging market. And who's interested in emerging markets? Well, you know, people in Thai like me, professionals, we want to get new customers, we want to get new markets, that's what we thrive for. So if you manage to match both sides together, you get a win-win deal. So our product is based on a Ruby on Rails framework. Um, this is just the basic stuff, there's a lot more features to it, but basically you go up there and you type in what is your dream, what is your issue, then you, you look at if it exists in the database, in which case you can uh, join the, a dream team, which is a group of people that actually but so follow that, that here. And as the, as the number grows, you, it will attract professionals who will want to serve this new market and who will submit new solutions to it. Now I have a special process to determine which solutions are the best match. And I only showcase a couple of them, so then the people can pick the one they like. And here again, I have also a process to define uh, a way so that they take the decision in the most fair way for everybody. And this is just like a window where you can monitor the um, status of all the dreams you have. But you guys don't care about all this blah blah, you care about that, I know, especially that. Uh, there's nothing disruptive here, so we just charge a small fee, 3 to 5% on the final transaction when you actually buy a solution. And we also have premium accounts that enable you to showcase your dream or your solution in a better way on the side. The team is composed of the glorious Kawina, who unfortunately could not make it today with us, and myself. There's a little bit of background about us. We also have this little guy here, the drawing. It means that uh, we automate everything as we can on the platform to, to make it as lean as uh, automated as possible. And we plan to get more people on board as we start, because as of today we haven't launched yet. So this is our estimate forecast figures for the first year of operation, which is 2016, uh, based on these worst case assumptions. I'll leave that a second. 
for the meditation. And to conclude, I just presented you a very unique model, which is based on the people's needs that they willingly enter. They do not go to like sneak for it, like Google does, you know. Um, and it also provides professionals with a direct access to the customers that actually want to buy those stuff because they need it. And I don't know if anybody has an economics background in the room, but basically what this is, this is the invisible hand, you know, that drives the market forces based on the needs of the society. And that's my message, thank you very much. And yet I did, couldn't find, find any information on this on the internet. Um, and if you didn't, um, are you looking for outside funding? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, we became profitable pretty much immediately as we released the game. And uh, obviously we have had a lot of you know, VC companies uh, to start with who reached out to us. And then now we're in a phase where maybe more, more private equity companies are contacting us or even company brokers right now, but uh, so far we haven't done anything, so we still own this company 100% uh, for founders. Okay, so um, due to the global success of um, Quiz Clash, um, the um, game actually uh, got um, also um, adapted to uh, other platforms like uh, books and um, um, board games and even the German TV show, um, the Quiz Duel show. So, uh, how did you close the deal to actually do a German TV show affiliated to your game? How did that happen? Um, yeah, so I was contacted by ATV Nordic already in 2013 when we had the first success in Sweden and they wanted to sign a deal and we had about one year of negotiations. Um, and. As pretty much as soon as the ink dried on the paper, the game took off in Germany. Um, but strangely enough, like they didn't, they didn't really uh, do anything act on that. But I did an interview in Handelsblatt, and uh, the, the journalist asked me also, What's, what else is going on? And then I said, yeah, we have signed a deal with ITV. Uh, and then the journalist, being professional, he called ITV Germany and asked about that, so, and they didn't know about it. So they, of course, you know, they started uh, spinning on that and they contacted the headquarters in the UK and they found, out, uh, they found out, yeah, so apparently the Nordic ITV did this, so yeah, it was really quick that, like, I think it, that was one month from the sign was deal, uh, deal was signed, uh, that we started, uh, we met with ITV Germany and then about two months after that we had the uh, release, like the, the, the show aired in Germany, so well, that was really quick and as maybe some of you remember it was some technical issues the first uh, one and a half year back, but since then it's been running smoothly. Mm -hmm. But did it, did it have an, um, uh, an effect of the uh, download numbers? Um, so did they uh, increase in Germany dramatically when the um, uh, show aired? or? Not really, uh, actually, it was quite late, uh, I think we had about 17 million downloads in Germany by the time, so you know, obviously that's a significant part of the whole population, so it wasn't that much it could uh, grow from there, so of course we saw a small increase in downloads, but it was no big thing really. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one part of your um, uh, business model is um, obviously um, advertising, um, which gets shown in, within the app, um, but I guess uh, other revenue stream, streams might be uh, these board games or this, this TV deal and stuff or books, book um, uh, stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what, uh, how, how much of the overall revenue is actually coming from the app and uh, how much is coming from other revenue streams? Roughly 99% is from the game. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, so I was also wondering, um, like, um, in my um, in my uh, uh, observation, um, Quiz Duel was um, very popular like uh, one and a half years ago in, in Germany. I guess this was the time when it all took off, and um, I played it, my friends played it, but um, my feeling. No, no, it's too, too difficult, like I said. <laughs> so, um, my question is, uh, do you um, uh, see a, a down curve um, in, in Germany and, and now try to maybe compensate that with an internationalization strategy? Or um, do you see uh, 
steady numbers in established markets. Yeah, so the, we are obviously we're launching new markets all the time, but that was always a part of the initial strategy. So it's not really really responding to anything else. So we always plan to launch in as many markets as possible. Uh, and regarding the um, uh, obviously our game is of the character that it has a huge spike when it goes viral, and you know everyone is talking about it. And then, because um, we had the same in Sweden and all other countries where we had great success, and then people tend to think that it's, oh, that was popular a while back, which is obviously correct. But, you know, if we take Sweden, for example, it's a country with about 10 million people, 200,000 Swedes play our game every day. Like, daily active users is 200,000. And in Germany, we have, uh, I think, 2 million daily active, which is, very good, and it, uh, so we have an incredibly good retention rate. In Sweden, the retention hasn't really changed the last two years. So we see a huge spike in the beginning, but then we have a lot of really dedicated players. Because people tend to play with the family and close friends, and they, they have to use the game as a social tool to just stay in contact with the people. So um, we're not really worried about that. Um, not really. So, and then which country, uh, countries did you most recently launch and what countries are maybe uh, next or where you see the, the most um, potential right now? Um, most recently launched was maybe China, I think. Um, uh, and the, the best potential right now is uh, Indonesia, where we grow with about 50,000 new users every day. We have about 1.3 million right now and it's you know, it's a huge country, so that's going to take off uh, really, really good. It's topping the charts also. But it's actually the first country outside the Euro zone, and Russia is also a great market for us. But apart from like Europe and Russia, um, this is the first time we really reach outside of that uh, territory, which is pretty interesting uh, because China and Japan and Korea are different markets, uh, especially if you look at mobile gaming, they, they tend to have a slight different taste when it comes to, to games. In, in Europe we, we like uh, you know clean design and pretty easy interfaces and not too much stuff going on. Obviously this is generalization, you have all the really complicated MMOs and what have you, but like for casual games. But uh, the Japanese market and the Korean market, they, they love all these different stats and you know numbers flying by and stuff. So it hasn't really worked out in Asia, but Indonesia is an interesting uh, example where it actually works. So you said it, it hasn't really worked out. So you tried and it didn't take that. Uh, it didn't take off like this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, what else then? Translation and regional marketing. Do you do when you uh, launch this uh, clash in other countries? Um, yeah. So you know we hire people um, who are native speakers who knows the culture very well. Um, so there's a very thorough uh, process where we find proper, you know, good, good people to, to do the localization of the content. Uh, and then we use, obviously, their competence to, uh, to find out as much as possible uh, on the market we're launching. You know, everything about how, what kind of uh, targeting we can do on our, on, on our marketing campaigns and stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, we do a lot of really thorough research uh, before we start the campaigns, and we have a huge, uh, a really, really interesting strategy, which I can't go into too much into detail. Okay, okay. great. So uh, some people say that, uh, especially um, gaming apps, um, are a hit-driven business. So um, did you, uh, at some point, uh, had the fear that maybe? Quiz duel, quiz clash would be uh, like a one-hit wonder, and you couldn't maybe repeat the success uh, with another game. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I like this game since it's social, uh, since it's quiz. Um, for some reason, you know, or I guess for those reasons, it has a really long retention, as I mentioned before. So uh, it's not like these other maybe more casual single-player games, which is uh, maybe more hit. Uh, Hit-ish, um, but but yeah, obviously that's a risk. But we're we're not only focused. We are creating new games now also, which are going to be in the same kind of area of casual gaming. But we're also trying to do as much as we ever can with with the brand that we have created in you know large parts of, of Europe. Um, so for example, we are 
uh, obviously they're branching out with TV show and uh, board game and that kind of stuff. But also we're now looking to create a professional tool for companies uh, where they can use the Quizlet platform to internal uh, education policies and uh, products and stuff like that. So we've had I don't know maybe a hundred requests for that from from a lot of huge companies. Um, for a long time we never you know, had time to pay attention to it. But now when we have a bigger stru uh, structure and you know everything is more organized, we can take a step back and, and we've actually developed that too. So that's a way of kind of broadening the, the whole quiz uh, concepts too. Awesome. So in, at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned that you're also working right now on a game for Americans and dumber people. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's, it's called, it's called uh, Pink's Twill, yeah. right? Yeah. So can you uh, give us a brief introduction of what it is about and what's the current stage of it? Um, yeah. So it is released in the States um, and it's, you know, it's pretty much exactly as uh, Quizlet, but it's uh, slightly different colors and you know, slightly different graphics and then it's um, only uh, photo and image questions and everything is much easier and the categories are things like candy and soda and uh, entertainment and stuff very much targeted for the Americans. <laughs> so, um, you're actually um, doing video media and uh, quiz well now for uh, quite some time and uh, is there something that um, you regret, regret on your entrepreneurial journeys? So something that you would do other um, uh, with, with that knowing what you know now? Uh, uh, I think that uh, I would say regret, but uh, now obviously I have much more experience from dealing with bigger companies. So uh, yeah, maybe early on uh, I was a bit too. Uh, um, I wanted to. I don't know. No, not really. I, I would say I learned a lot, but I wouldn't really do things differently. It's more like maybe I've done done things slightly better, obviously, uh, a few years ago. But uh, no, not really. Not really. Okay. Great, so now we will have some um, time for a QA. and a um, If someone of you has a question for Robert. Yeah. Hey, I'm Andrew. This is like totally not serious, but thanks for doing this because I get a 10 minute break every night from my girlfriend who I love very much, but she's obsessed with your game, it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing is actually related to that, it, she, she's German, does a quiz in German. It's great. And she says, hands me the phone and says, Do you want to do any of the quiz? By the time I've read the question, so we've got. <laughs> do you actually, a lot of people, and not just in this stuff, but a lot of people use different apps to learn languages. Do you see a lot of, lot of your users actually doing that? Do you have a pause or slow motion for me? Um, I don't really know if people use it like that. I, I know that there have been requests from, from teachers and, and uh, um, such who wants to use it like that. And obviously, obviously you can. Uh, I guess you would have to have a longer time bar than, yeah, or at least slower. Uh, but yeah, you know, that, that's the direction where we're heading with this, uh, first of all, the, the company internal training tool that we're building. And we're looking at, you know, in, the, in a longer perspective also, broadening into to more educational stuff. Um, we have a lot of data, obviously, on the usage uh, and about trivia questions in general. Like, so, so we want to go into education, but uh, not, not, not primarily uh, language, I would say. So one question uh, from me. Um, are the quiz clash uh, players uh, more female or more male? It's, it's actually very, um, it's almost 50-50, like 49-51. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Uh, hey, um, for me, I was very, I was amazed when you said uh, you were almost profitable from the beginning. I would like to know, was there some like ingenious marketing guerrilla strategy, or did you do something, or was your product just so great that it automatically started? Yeah, the latter. It was. <laughs> uh, the thing is. Um, uh, yes, it, it was actually we, we copied the market like the uh, the monetization model directly from a lot of other similar games like Words with Friends and uh, Russell and games like that. So we knew that it should work, uh, like the premium concept and the ads in game. So 
you know, since we got our users, we immediately saw that it works. People are buying premium, they don't like ads that much, and a lot of people are okay with ads, and we make revenue from that too, so, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good model. Um, in the beginning, when you started the whole um, concept of Quiz Clash, did you like put a prototype on the market? Did you like try to figure out which function will be used, or did you like put straight away the, the product as we know it on the market? Um, no, it's we put it pretty much as it is right now on market. Yeah. So I guess the game design was uh, was lucky in a way, even though we did internally obviously tested a lot. We had a bunch of different iterations before we found we came up with the like final word version that ended up being on the market. But we, we actually never changed any functionality. Not really, not, not from the first uh, launch version. No. So and you also don't change the functionality or um, uh, game mechanics uh, when you um, uh, adopt it to different um, countries, right? It all Basically, just a translation. Yeah, well, there is these more like anime style avatars in Asia, um, but that's pretty much it. Obviously, different fonts too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, nothing else. Perfect. Any other questions? No? Okay. <laughs> ah, here. How many of the questions are user generated versus um, curated or created by the team in the company? Um, about half. We start with, you know, roughly 20,000 questions when we release, and then, you know, it adds up uh, to... It's interesting, right now it's, I, I think it's maybe, yeah, 40 or 50,000-ish. But it becomes very hard after a while to, to get more questions in the game, because it turns out that a lot of the general stuff is covered at a certain point, and then, you know, we have a lot of, obviously, you know, internal tools with AI, um, scoring the questions by uniqueness and uh, language quality and stuff like that. And we found out that it's very hard to, you know, putting new stuff there because uh, when you, you, you have that huge content, um, it starts to become very, very narrow stuff. So 50-50, you know, after a while, it's very difficult for people to come up with new, broad enough concepts. Thanks, one more question then. Uh, be profitable from day one. What's been your relationship with the investors? Are they been trying to kind of come in from doors and windows and you've been keeping them away or <laughs> <laughs> well you know they are, they are approaching us still uh, but uh, as I mentioned before not so much VC anymore because they know now that we don't need it. Um, uh, but yeah I don't know I uh, we, we were uh, very lucky uh, in that sense, I guess, that we could uh, keep the independence, but maybe there, there could have been, have been upsides from, from getting investors too, because we could have probably had some really good uh, uh, advices from them also in some of the steps that we've taken. So, you know, I don't really know how to write, what are my <laughs> relations to them. The, yeah, nothing. <laughs> okay, any other questions? No? Okay, that's perfect. So, um, so this was faster than expected. So uh, some of you already are eating. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I would say we uh, just now open the, for the networking break and um, see you again here on stage in like uh, 45 minutes. Thank you. People spend more and more time reading reviews, comparing prices and micro planning updates. Finding and ensuring you have the perfect trip can actually be stressful as well as time consuming. We solve the headache of planning and booking trips in a way much more user friendly, efficient, and interactive than a traditional travel agent or online travel agent. A trip book will last you only a couple of minutes and gives you a fully personalized itinerary, place to stay, and travel method. We use a wide range of data sources, combined with user input, dynamic indices, and smart algorithms to give you the best city break you can get. We include getting to your destination, door to door, the perfect place to stay um, based on your budget, the proximity to the attractions in your itinerary and other factors, and we help you choose attractions 
That's based upon what's best in the city and your personal preferences. If that wasn't enough, we also optimize the itinerary to take into account traveling time, um, opening hours, and we map every single journey for you with the best method of transportation. Um, in the previous slide, the tubes and so it was London, walking cities and might be walking. We also budget every aspect of the trip. So previously we had the flights and here we have a hotel attraction and for city transport. Our business model, as well as working with our online travel companies, we work with B2B wholesalers, ensuring that not only do we provide highly competitive pricing, but we make significant margins, predominantly on hotels, but also on flights, car hire, and on attractions. Our main way of achieving revenue will be e-commerce, and in the future, m-commerce, as we'll have both site and app, and along with app and web advertising. We also plan to monetize our data in the future, as we thought it could be very valuable in the uh, hospitality industry, especially for hotels um, with travel trends. Uh, that's an example of choosing attractions where we have personally curated um, information there based upon what the user is interested in and what's best in the city. So, our market potential. We believe that we have a unique position in the marketplace as currently there is no personalised end-to-end -end solution that caters to all aspects of the trip. Moreover, our unique approach to budgeting should make travellers more worry-free and encourage them to travel as they'd actually be able to accurately estimate how much a trip would cost. Um, we have a food and drink index, as a lot of people often overlook how expensive it can be to eat and drink out in the city. Um, and that compares the home city to the city that they're traveling to. Uh, we hope to establish a spontaneous travel market and get people to travel more often and better if a trip is planned on in just a few minutes. Uh, we think it will be especially popular with students as we integrate with hostels as well as hotels and provide personal, personalised low-cost trips. Um, the planning, the health and planning aspect may well help students as they're probably travelling for the first few times by themselves. We also think that young workers aged 18 to 35 of medium, medium to medium high incomes are our other core demographic. As we believe they're a lot more likely to travel spontaneously than older people who have responsibilities. And yet they're still made to the time poor, as is the case in the UK. We believe that we'll achieve high conversion rates compared to traditional travel agents, online travel agents. This is because uh, this is because we believe that last minute trips tend to have high conversion rates, as people are spending, if they're traveling a couple of days, they spend less time comparing and shopping around. And the fact that our users will tend to be people who are time poor, so much more likely to look and book rather than spend a lot of time looking around. The size of our two core markets are above 6 billion people in the UK alone, above 10% of the population, and much larger in mainland Europe. I look forward to any questions that you may have. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> have you ever been to a music festival and couldn't find your friends in the crowd? It happens to me every time. Have you ever lost your printed lineup and missed a gig by your favorite band? I have. And only because of lack of cashless technology, my wallet was once stolen at a festival. And I know that my friends and lots of other festival goers have exactly the same problems every single year. So we found a solution. Fastblast makes Music festivals a hassle-free experience. The concept is simple. Festival goers can discover festivals based on their music taste, buy tickets, organize their trip, and find their friends at the venue. We provide festival goers with everything they need before, during, and after the fest. We believe that every festival goer should have the 21st century experience, no matter what festival they go to. The music industry now turns more to concerts and festivals for money. Live music is uh, how music artists make 80% of their revenue, so festival market is booming and is estimated to be worth $10 billion a year. 
The market is highly fragmented, so it feels right for disruption. And in terms of uh, our growth, it's 28% month over month. We launched in uh, March 2015. Uh, the market, there are thousands of music festivals, and only 260 of them are equipped with mobile apps provided by our, our two major competitors. Thanks to FestBlast, festival goers and organizers save time and money by having all necessary information in one place in a smart way. For festival organizers, we offer 30% better prices and we deliver the results four times faster. Uh, in terms of our revenue streams, we have three main revenue streams. Uh, first, commissions on tickets and travel. Second, contactless uh, solutions and mobile solutions on site. And analytics, as we can leverage the huge potential of data that we have. Uh, our team has a strong technical and uh, business background with experience gained in leading tech companies and banks. Uh, Myself and the second co-founder, my sister, we are engineers. And uh, so far, we've managed to establish uh, partnerships with uh, festivals, including festivals in the Netherlands, uh, US, uh, Italy and Poland. Thank you. And have you noticed that everyone is talking about storytelling these days? not only in the traditional creative industries, but also in business and in this room. The market, as we estimate it, which is serviceable and addressable to us, we estimate 4.7 billion. Uh, and funnily enough, even though this market is relatively big, there are very, very few web-based solutions for storytellers to structure their stories with, to build their stories with. So let's look at the process. How are stories actually made? What is the story really? Storytellers tend to still use analog methods, whatever type of storytellers they are, even if they're, if they're authors or marketeers. That what they often do is they get an index card, like a flash card like this, and put an idea on it, note an idea on it, perhaps for a scene or for a plot uh, event, and stick it on a corkboard on a wall. And they have a load of cards like this. This is a very typical picture um, for, for planning, uh, for organizing a story. Now, wouldn't it be cool if you could keep all this information, capture all that information online on a digital project in a database. Because then you could filter it, you could search for items, you could make different orders, you could save different versions. Yeah? Better still, you can collaborate with people who aren't in the room, who are on the other side of the world. And you can use connectivity tools, connectivity with, with, with when you've got your dedicated outlining or structuring tool here and connect that with the, with the tool which does the execution of the stories. Yeah? So for an author, that might, might be something like a, a, even a basic text editing program. Yeah? So that's what we do. That's what BMG does. We take this basic analog idea of the cards on the wall and put it in an online environment and create structure views like this, for example, which every filmmaker knows. So where are we now? We've been online since March with a very small part of our entire tool, which is a character development tool. And we've got, even though we haven't spent a cent on marketing, we've uh, got over 700 projects on there already. We've got returning visitors, which is great, at about 34% monthly. Our business plan uh, got into the finals of BBV here in Berlin, and it just started to grow. And we've been selected as top 50 Ace Creative Company, which is a European accelerator. Within this top 50, we've been selected uh, as top 15 to go to Copenhagen next month for the Creative Business Cup. Um, so, as to the money, we've uh, this is the best thing yet. We've already, on the strength of our idea, got an investor um, that's a German media holding company. Uh, that have given us about a, a third of uh, what we require in total. We require us a little bit more in order to fully realize our, our entire plans. Uh, because what we're going to do um, is address uh, one market after another, because this market is, is quite segmented, and you've got all sorts of different types of storyteller, um, and we're going to uh, address them one after another. We're going to start off with traditional storytelling and then go into marketing, etc. So, um, yeah, I'll talk about the levers and stuff if you, if you want to know more about the money in the Q&A. 
Um, that's my pitch. Let me just get into the appendix and show you um, our team. Me, I've got a, a background um, in, mar in marketing books. Uh, I worked for Vorwald and for Carlsen for a long time, which to Germans means something. Um, and these two guys at the top, Robert and Zambia, they're the tech guys in, in the team. Um, we've also got AC Coppins, who's great. She knows every single filmmaker there is, I think. Okay. Um, and we've got our UX guy, Guy Martin, who's fantastic about all of the whole teams. But this isn't even all of them. We've got a couple more working in, uh, programmers as well. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Clément Franco, the CEO of Pitocat. Um, what we want to achieve here is um, cut the cost of international transactions. Today, we have a big problem. When you, when you want to do business with, business with China, um, you have here are those fees. Um, as you can see here, um, when I mean fees, is that you have a lot of hidden fees. You have the fees of your banks, and you have also the, the rates of the currency you want to buy, which is different. When I mean different, it's uh, more expensive for you. Um, what we are achieving now is uh, cutting these fees by two, and also uh, we reduce the time to, um, to transfer the money from 10 days to 3 days. How can we do that? Is by using Bitcoin technology. Um, with Bitcoin, what you can do here is using um, several platforms. Um, so you, you, you buy Bitcoins with your euros, then you sell it directly in China, and this operation takes less than 3 days. If you want to do that with a bank, it takes between 5 and 10 days. Um, and here, um, this is uh, possible because we, we avoid the global banking system. Um, the team is made by people which, is, which are good enough in technology to enable this platform to work. Um, I was in uh, Staffarm Alpha, which is very well known um, for a um, biometric solution, so very high level of security for any solution they used. Um, the strategy here is to start with what we have as clients. So today we are in Eura Technology, which is a French incubator in the north of France. Um, the next step, once we build uh, the product with our basically our neighbors, um, is built on the trust we made with, with that to go and find other SMEs that we are that I need to cut the costs. Um, the milestones. So today we, we really focused on having something that actually work. And then um, the public release will be in the beginning of 2016. And in 2017 we would like to be at break even. So basically we don't lose any, any more money. Uh, we don't need any investment for that, we just do it uh, we just pay our salaries with what we what we make, and um, um, when once we are convinced that this is actually working and the trend is there, we are then looking uh, for investors. Um, so what makes us confident that this will work is because today we were also proposing solution for merchants. Uh, we had them cost their fees by using Bitcoin to get paid. Um, but um, today they ask us to, um, to go and help them on other markets. Um, so that's why we, we moved to what I proposed. Thank you. <clears throat> so besides this, uh, this bit of my life, building and running accounting businesses in China, and all the problems my clients met were very much of the same four types. This is my first client with QuickDroid, a German company that set up a business in Beijing and immediately hit the problem of a different language, people working differently, say reporting not being done, procedures not being followed, and the possibility of a fraud. They hired us, and instead of going in and sending tons of people, we rolled out the system we had developed for ourselves six years before and had been trained on ourselves. 
German company, tough crowd, tough customers. Within a, this, this thing was a, was a success uh, for a simple reason, is that this uh, application works in six languages and is very easy to swap from one language to another. It replaces basically all the paper transactions you do for the life of a company, be it uh, asking for the reimbursement of something, recognizing an income, or asking for vacations, and everything goes into the same database. Within a year, we had implemented it on 20 plus client sites. Very shortly thereafter, other accounting firms contacted us to roll that out on their own clients, license our application for a simple reason. Selling accounting, selling services is very hard. You have to create trust, but this, you just go see people, show them something that works, and you're in. And once you're in, it's easier to sell further. It gets paper pushing, everything happens online, and it allows the accountants to focus on what they do best, on their core skills, and therefore to increase their margins. Also, it helps them identify problems and therefore sell more services. What does it do? Basically, it's a system that gives standardized systems within your, uh, the operations of your company, which is the biggest problem that I have seen in international business of all these years. It is also internet-based and secure, which allows you to be in the office when you're on the beach on your 4G phone in Phuket. You never know where your money goes. With that, you follow everything from expenses to the income, the tax, everything. It is the clear-cut, easiest solution to use and beyond this, the information you get, since everything is based on drop-down menus that are pre-formatted and pre-translated, will be in your language of choice as long as it is within French, English, German, Spanish, Italian, and Chinese. This is what it looks like. It is actually a very tried and robust solution that just needs scaling today with a good sales team. So who manages QuickDroid? QuickDroid is founded and started by me. I was one of the co-founders of Scanline the company that allows you now to shoot QR codes with your cell phones. Very cool technology. Um, <laughs> I founded my accounting firm that is now one of the largest independent foreign accounting firms in China. Uh, Co-founded Club Beautiful, uh, that's something we have to have a beer to discuss, <laughs> and uh, created Investity, a system to direct investments to the right cities. Right? I'm also Vice President of a VC uh, a Venture Capital, for those of you who have not followed, uh, in Beijing, called First Term Equity. And I am a Professor of International Business in a few places. The guy who runs the soul of the application is Olivier Silbert, who's been in China for over 20 years and is a very experienced programmer. Business model, in one second, Yes. <laughs> uh, distribution through accounting firms. It's the accounting firms that will use it because it allows them to sell better and make more money out of their existing clients. It's on a SAS basis, paper license, and beyond that there is an option to make higher margins with optional services such as analysis services uh, and customization into an ERP-like system. Quick droid. The droid you're looking for. <laughs> the thing is that everybody wants the only person to date. And uh, at the moment, we want to dance with everybody. But you don't have questions? You don't like my... Uh... <laughs> So, oh, we're starting with, so we're starting with China, then the strategy is to, to basically conquer China and then, then take on the rest of the world. I if love, I got this right. I love the way you say it. Uh, the thing is that, at the moment, China is where I was, and I'm moving back to Europe for 
personal reasons, but also for one reason, which is that Europe is the perfect market for this. You have some 20 something languages, completely different regulations everywhere, unified by a global regulatory framework. It's perfect, we're going to make a killing. We'll see. <laughs> but thank you for your question. <laughs> perfect, thank you, Stefan. So we will have now one uh, additional pitch and uh, afterwards we are um, doing um, a little uh, change in the uh, agenda because uh, our um, uh, fireside chat, uh, guest uh, Anna has to leave on, um, on 7 o'clock. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll down, now do the main loss pitch and the other pitches will uh, continue uh, after the uh, fireside chat. So welcome to the stage, main loss. Hi, my name is Marta, I am a lawyer and I am co-founder of Main Loss. The other co-founder sits in the back, Joanna. Um, Main Loss is an online marketplace for legal services. Um, you can find and hire a lawyer, a reputable lawyer here. For the clients it is perfect, whatever you need. A single uh, case lawyer or you need to manage your legal tasks, uh, few legal tasks, because it's a, a fully featured platform that allows you not only to find and hire the lawyer, but also to manage the entire workflow and to make a payment. And for the lawyers, it is additional way how to generate new clients' leads and work, of course, efficiently and remotely. Um, legal market, legal services market, is highly fragmented. Uh, in Europe, we have 850,000 actively working barristers. In single country, United Kingdom, we have 1,050 actively working lawyers. And imagine if everyone has website, Twitter account, or uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, for one single client, it is highly impossible to compare the skills and find someone who is good for your case and uh, you accept their price. And here comes my loss. And for the lawyers, it is a perfect way to generate new leads and to uh, be on the market, wider market, and have new clients for your business. So, um, we came with this idea uh, because we, the, we discovered that uh, there is a gap. There is no such a thing like on-demand legal services. Um, our competitors offer you a list of lawyers or just addresses uh, and we uh, offer you a list of reputable lawyers, uh, entire workflow managed online uh, and uh, also uh, the way you can choose with whom you would like to work. And uh, our mission is to create an access to the legal services for everyone, from everywhere. Thank you very much. And, um, yes. <laughs> uh, so, me too. Welcome. Um, um, when, when was the first time that you uh, discovered your entrepreneurial way? So, I... Um, Actually, I, I used to, I, I did, I explained a little bit how, how I came into this whole startup scene already a few years ago. So I did my very first internship when I was still in university with KPMG. And it was the tax department in Frankfurt and it was the worst three months of my life actually. I went out there after three months and thought like, seriously, this should be the next 40 years of my life. <laughs> I would rather kill myself. And back then actually like startups was a big thing. Ah, this is my dog. Yeah, maybe. Okay, good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back then, startup wasn't a big thing actually. But a friend of mine said, like, there's a small company in Berlin, and maybe you should try the right, try this path. And so I did my very first internship with Smava. Does anybody know this? It's um, already eight years or nine years ago now. So it's a P2P lending platform, one of the very first ones out there. Yes, and I was amazed after three months. I felt so, it felt great. I, I had a lot of ideas, I changed a lot of things there. I worked very closely with the founder and I just loved it. And um, I think that was a time when I decided for myself there's no other way than, than following this path and founding my own company at some point. And how did you and your co-founder uh, come up with the idea for Outfittery? 
So um, Julia and I met when we worked for Zalando, and we actually saw this huge opportunity in the menswear space and, and saw like men are a completely underestimated target group. So most of the offers just focusing and targeting women and, and, and men have to search hard for, for the button on the website somewhere to, to find the menswear. Um, and then actually we got, so, so we saw this space and said we wanted to, to crack the menswear space. And then we got inspired in New York where a friend of ours um, booked a personal shopper, which is very common in New York for a successful businessman. And um, after two hours he came back and he was completely overwhelmed, happy and said it was the best shopping experience he ever had. And now he has this office to-do list for the next six months. Um, and he spent quite some money. But he was completely happy, and then we thought maybe this is the way how a Europe, European man like to shop as well, and, and, and try to think about how we can bring this online and combine it with the convenience of e-commerce. So one of your career stages before Outfittery was Rocket Internet, obviously, and um, what did you learn there that you later brought into Outfittery? So it was a good school for, for me, I must say. I saw four different projects I worked on. I, 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 we as well close shut down one of them and so on. It was a good experience as well. But I think altogether to sum it up, it was the I lost the like I lost the fear of, of, of speed kind of. I mean we grew rapidly in all all these ventures and um, it, so it felt more natural for us now to grow at Fitter in the same speed as well. So um, you are obviously grow, grown um, very fast and rapidly and you're now um, over 20, uh, 200 um, employees. Uh, how do you ensure um, that there's a good corporate culture and that your employees uh, feel um, happy? Yeah, that's a good question. And this is definitely something that I didn't learn at Rocket. So it was like on the Rocket side we learned really to execute and then we said and, and when we found it on Twitter, we actively decided not to take Rocket as an investor on board because we wanted to combine this execution actually with good company culture, um, which is very essential for us because we are a service company and when, when, when one of the stylists is hating her job, the, the customer would immediately notice actually on the, on the other side of the phone. So we very much were up to like how, how can we create a good culture. And I mean, there is not this one rule to create Sure. But, I mean, this is, it, it is very much the people that you hire, it is very much how you treat them, it is very much how you, how you behave yourself, how open you are for, for critics and, and, and critical feedback, because this is the only way to learn. And what we kept telling our whole management team is as well, so I, of course we have some years of experience, but I haven't, I haven't scaled like 10 companies before and I'm not in the business for 50 years and know everything. So the only path to success is to really be extremely honest and um, be very critical with one and each other as well in, in order to really grow personally. And I think this is the culture that, that we have made um, so we are very, we are a team, extremely ambitious people, and we are, we are, we do what is best for the company and not what is best for, for our ego, our, our service and politics, or so. So I hate internal politics. However, I see it in politics. So, um, so yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, the, the outfittery customers um, get their own stylist, um, as I understand, and. Um, get suggested uh, complete outfits um, that fits their uh, style and size. Uh, how do you make sure, or how do, does the stylist uh, make sure that they really uh, need the, um, uh, the, 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 the style um, and the preferences of the customers? Yeah, so the customers sign on online and give us some information there. And then um, for, for the first contact, we like to do a call as well. But in this call, many customers remind, remember some things. Ah, I need a code. Ah, yeah, you're right, it's turning cold, whatever. And, 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 and this is a very nice moment and usually the effect as well, where there's a kind of friendship started between the customer and the stylist. So this is how we, how we got the information. And then um, the stylist um, is, from, on the other hand, supported internally via our tools where we actually use data and, and machine learning to, to support her. But it's always the combination of human intelligence and machine intelligence and human intelligence is a very, very important part of this. Okay, I see. 
So, um, with Outfittery, you were able, able to uh, secure lots of uh, venture capital. Uh, so, the public data suggests numbers like over 30 million euro or something. Um, and uh, these names of investors um, are top notch <coughs> European uh, VCs and uh, also, I guess, one or two uh, American VCs. Um, could you share maybe with the audience um, the the main do's and don'ts when you try to raise uh, funding? Is there something you would, uh, a hint, a tip that you would suggest? So again, there is not this one recipe for, 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 for getting funding. Um, in the end, I mean, it, it very much depends on your stage. And I now think that you are in a very early stage altogether. In this early stage, there's nothing to judge actually from the investor side. So yeah, you can pre present your business model, but there you have no data that you can, can build on, that you can show. So in this very early stage, it's mainly the team and the ambition and the energy of the team that you need to prove, because this is what the investor is selling you. So he's buying your, your, your energy and, uh, and trusts you that, that you're doing good with his money. So I, and then in later stages, of course, the performance and the real numbers getting more and more. Um, important, um, yeah, but um, so you need to have good numbers, a good, good vision, you need to know where, where, where you go. And for us, it always helps that our investors are using our service as well and very much love the service. So um, if you have a product that you can really show and make them feel, how, make, show them how it feels to use this product and what the real benefit is, not just telling them, that helps a lot. So Outfitter is operating right now in eight uh, different European countries. Um, what are the next milestones uh, for Outfitter, or maybe also the next countries um, uh, to um, to enter? Um, and um, yeah, what are the next milestones? We'll conquer the world. <laughs> the galaxy. So Europe is not enough. Europe is not enough. Definitely not. Um, so. Um, yeah, we, we have brought this, this concept of personal shopping very far and we see that there's a huge interest. Um, so we just did a market study where 40% of the relevant target group, so which is men over 25, say they want to try personal shopping in the next months or, or years. Um, so there's a huge space to grow into and we will rapidly continue growing in our existing countries, but as well go to new countries as well. But first grab the rest of Europe and then above. Okay, so um, I recently, I guess I saw some outfittery TV advertising. Um, what, what are the main um, marketing channels for you and what works best in your opinion? Yeah. So the main channels are really referrals because we have a very viral product and this is something we completely underestimated at the beginning. We said like, okay, no man will ever talk about fashion. But then we were proven wrong, um, fortunately, actually. And we noticed that a lot of our customers started talking about, hey, I have my own stylist now. And a lot of customers do get compliments suddenly from, from their colleagues, friends, whatever, for their new style, for their new outfits, and then they talk about it. So this is a really huge, uh, huge channel for us. Many customers send their packages to the office, and then the colleagues see it and notice and sign up as well, and so on. Um, and then, um, but coming, I mean, from the rocket background, we of course do some like, performance marketing channels as well, um, and there we do mainly Facebook and TV. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, what were the main stumbling blocks during the first three years of Outfittery? And um, is there something um, you have in mind what you, when you say, uh, if I knew then what I knew now, uh, know now, I would have done it differently? So, are there any regrets along the way? So the, yeah, I mean, sure, we've done tons of things wrong <laughs> and we learned a lot uh, in the last years. I think to some extent, the certain um, not knowing how the industry works helped us a lot since it gave us the freedom to think differently, right? So, I mean, if you look into the, to the retail space, for example, all the retailers are, are discounting heavily and we don't give discounts, right? And if you ever tell this to some retailers, they say, what, you don't give discounts? This is not possible, right? And all, all these things. So I think a certain ignorance is very healthy towards an industry and to not limit yourself in, in your mind in order to what is possible. And um, 
but of course we, we need to, to have some learnings as well along the way and like how is it to work together with the brands and to which extent we can really change the logic of, of, of this whole industry. Um, so one thing I, I might have would have been different is to get more experienced people on board earlier. So quite a few sort of things that we needed to learn ourselves were well, expensive, so we brought like the wrong inventory in the beginning and, and so on. I mean, this was all on a, on a small scale, but but still. So this maybe I would have done differently. But keep like don't let them ruin like your dreams and, and your view on the things. Like in naive view in a certain way, in a certain ignorance is really important as well in the combination. Mm -hmm. Okay, and being a female entrepreneur. Um did you discover uh, any disadvantage, uh, disadvantages being female in the startup world um, during the last years? I don't know, I've never been male. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe if you were male, the startup would now be worldwide already. <laughs> so, I, I've never... Uh, okay, I, I overheard this. <laughs> No, uh, seriously, I mean, you can't change your gender and just go for what you want to do um, and don't, don't let anybody like hold you back. And I must say, I always uh, think, I think there are a lot of advantages being a woman um, in, a, in a man's world. Okay, so too. So, um, we, we would now have time for some Q&A. Um, there are some uh, questions in the audience. Yes. So let us talk about travel again. Who of you has been traveling this year? Hands up. Okay, almost everybody had a um, So what about city trips? We're living in the age of cheap flights and um, broad access to accommodation. But there's a huge problem. The user experience of city trips is frustrating. And why? Because we take days of research in advance. Because in travel, um, good enough is not good enough, it has to be perfect for us. Today in e-commerce, the biggest challenge is not about, not about providing availability, it is about finding the perfect product for the, correct, for the right customers. And in travel, there's something this guy here remembers from the past, it's called travel agents. These discovered the perfect trips for us. So with the internet, something went wrong. My name is Matthias Reinholz, I'm co-founder and CEO of Getaway, and we will fix that for you. Getaway is in closed beta at the moment. We have a strong focus on tech development, and we created an algorithm that utilizes the data of more than 1.2 million potential city trips every day. With this amount of data, we create inspirational and hassle-free city trips for you. Being a user of Getaway, you get about 10 amazing city trips every day delivered to you. you uh, amazing for us means at least a flight and a premium hotel in the city center and it's a, it's a great price. There is detailed information on price development. There is local tour guidance and you can book the whole trip on our website. Some years ago I have been to Lisbon with my fiancé. We love that city. And since then, we always have this latent desire to be back there. And I bet almost every one of you will have this secret place you'd love to be back someday. But we, we, we don't do that. And why? Because we don't spend these days in research. So I can tell you something. The first thing when getaway is life that I'm going to do is I grab the first opportunity and go to Lisbon. So then I'm finally going to wear this hat again. And if you want to follow that, check out my Twitter here. What makes Getaway special? We are not the next website providing you with a search for something. We inspire you with exceptional travel opportunities. We simplify your access to outstanding city trips. And as a team, we love to learn. We love feedback and the conversation with our users. In the past weeks, we generated more than a thousand sign-ups without spending any money. And in the last four weeks, we received more than 1,400 messages and we replied to them. And this is the feedback and the conversation I just talked about. 
So now it's time for you to join this conversation. Visit gtwy.com and sign up for our closed beta. Use this code and get instant access. And maybe you'll rediscover your secret place. And then you'll be able to discover your own smart way with Getaway. Thanks. I'm actually a woman, but I changed my gender to be more successful at Thomas' conference. <laughs> So, my name is Vilu, I'm a co-founder at Thunderbeam. Uh, so, assuming that humanity does not kill itself in the next 100 years, uh, if you believe people like Michio Kaku, for example, the famous uh, physicist, uh, you might also believe in the beginning of a planetary economy. Or, you know, kind of like that. So, Assuming that humanity is working toward more progress, what do you think the answer to this question might be? Just think about it in your brain. No need to shout it out, because if it doesn't match with mine, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, but basically, the answer to this, the great current last giant anachronism in early stage startup investing, is the fact that there's no liquidity for investors. There is no global marketplace uh, for investments and the ability to sell and buy those investments. Kind of like you do on NASDAQ, for example. So, uh, another way to put this, if you're not an investor yourself, is to imagine that three guys, three organizations are having a baby. One, Bloomberg. They provide data on companies, right? AngelList, they do syndicates, syndicated investments. And NASDAQ, obviously, is the marketplace. So, you probably know where me and the airplane guy is going. Thunderbeam is building a thing just like that. A marketplace for early stage startup investments. Uh, right now, we're live with a data intelligence product on uh, startups and investors worldwide, and this will be something that will lubricate the marketplace because obviously data is pretty important. There's one thing here, mention of blockchain. Uh, I mentioned the word planetary quite a bit, and uh, I would claim that blockchain is perhaps the beginning of uh, a planetary ledger, a place where ownership uh, records, transactions are being safely, securely, transparently, quickly recorded. So we've actually integrated uh, the blockchain into uh, what we're building, and uh, this uh, product will be beta launching in December, the marketplace that is. Uh, here's a picture of how it works. I'm gonna do a quick run through. So basically, we do data, we do syndicated investments, and we have an aftermarket where you can trade with your investments. So you get a lead investor at the beginning who puts together a syndicate, invites backers or backing investors to join them. Uh, then, together, they will invest in a syndicate. They, it might be a micro fund, it might be a special purpose vehicle, a separate company, an organization of some sort. And then that particular syndicate invests in either one startup or a group of startups, an industry uh, syndicate, for example. And then in return, they will get digital representations of their investments. So they don't directly invest in a startup, but they invest in a syndicate. And what they get in return is digital tokens that uh, or bits and pieces of that syndicate. Uh, and this is where the blockchain comes in. Uh, it's uh, uh, verified by the blockchain, and the syndicates, the tokens themselves, are actually colored coins. We're working with, uh, it's, a, it's a form of Bitcoin, basically, with extra information attached to it. We're working with a color point pioneer called Chromaway uh, in working this out. And uh, you get a tiny little sliver of a Bitcoin or a colored coin that will sit in your wallet, and that represents your stake in a syndicate, and in return, your stake in the startup or a startup group. And then trading happens when you start trading with those tiny little colored coins. Uh, in itself, they're pretty worthless, but they represent value through the syndicate. Um, who are we? Uh, our founder is actually female, uh, main founder. Uh, she used to run the uh, NASDAQ OMX stock exchange in Estonia. Uh, 
Uh, we have uh, people who have taken companies public as advisors. Uh, I used to do PR and uh, marketing at Skype uh, in the early days. And uh, we have uh, some other folks who are you know, pretty knowledgeable in what we do. Uh, and obviously, yes, when we're cut, we actually bleed big data on startups and investors. So all of this mixed together is the first time anyone has uh, done kind of a sunrise to sunset uh, platform for startup investing and trading. Uh, from data to syndication to uh, after trading uh, on the blockchain, uh, which is just an enabling technology for us. We don't fetishize it in any way, but it's a fantastic thing that we can, we can write on. Um, and this is a tiny little mock-up of what things will look like uh, when um, December comes. And this, my friends, is pretty much it.